If you measure the size of a blast wave as a function of time, then the blast energy can be determined. This is what G.I. Taylor did using his formula and photographs of the Trinity test. In the previous video, I show you how to determine a general formula for the radius of a nuclear blast discovered by G.I. Taylor and independently by John von Neumann. Five years after the end of World War II, in 1950, G.I. Taylor published two articles. The first one was a declassified version of his original report from 1941, titled The Formation of a Blast Wave by a Very Intense Explosion, Part 1. This was the topic of the previous video. Part 2 is the one in which he used his formula and today's topic. The morning of July 16, 1945, the most fascinating and terrifying experiment in the history of physics illuminated the New Mexico desert several times more than daylight. If you're curious how bright the explosion was, check the video where I calculated the brightness of the Trinity test. One of the most valuable records of the experiment was captured by dozens of high-speed cameras. The story goes that armed with his formula, G.I. Taylor was able to determine the blast energy of the first nuclear bomb only using some photographs. This story has been told many times, but they always skip the part of how Taylor did it. In this video, I will show you step by step how Taylor used his formula to determine the blast energy of the Trinity test. Julia Mack was a professor of physics at the University of Wisconsin. During the Manhattan Project, he was the leader of the photography group at Los Alamos, and he coordinated all the aspects for high-speed photography during the Trinity test. After the end of the war, Mack wrote a secret report containing a collection of photographs from the first milliseconds all the way to the first minute of the first nuclear explosion. On July 17, 1947, the day after the second anniversary of the Trinity test, the report written by Mack was declassified. The images on the report include timestamps and a length scale. All versions of the story claim that the photographs appear in an article on Life magazine, which Taylor used for his estimate. I have not been able to find the claim article. Long ago, I spent many hours checking every page of every article published between 1945 and 1950. No photograph of Trinity was found. Maybe I missed it. If someone knows the issue, please reach out because I really want to know. What I do know is where Taylor got the images from, because he wrote it on the third paragraph of his paper. Taylor used 17 photographs from Mack's declassified report in addition to seven declassified photographs from the British Ministry of Supply. Using the timestamps and length scale on each photograph, he determined the radius at different times. He obtained 25 pairs of radius versus time, and then he used his formula for the radius of the blast. His formula contains the independent variable, the time, with an exponent, so he used a classic trick in physics when we encounter these so-called power laws. We use logarithms. If you are not familiar with logarithms or need a reminder, there are only two rules that we need. The first one is called the product rule. It states that the logarithm of a product is equal to the sum of the logarithms. So the logarithm of a times b is equal to the logarithm of a plus the logarithm of b. The second one is called the exponent rule. This is in fact just a special case of the product rule. It states that the logarithm of a quantity with an exponent is equal to the exponent times the logarithm of the original quantity. So that the logarithm of a to the power of k is equal to k times the logarithm of a. Going back to Taylor's formula, if we take logarithms on both sides, we get log of r on the left, and log of everything else on the right. Using the product rule, we can separate time from everything else. Now we can rearrange terms and use the exponent rule, so that the logarithm of t to the two-fifths becomes two-fifths of logarithm of t, plus everything else. If we now multiply everything by phi divided by two, we get phi divided by two times log of r on the left, and log of t plus a bunch of terms on the right. 
This expression looks messy, but by carefully looking at each term, what we have found is in fact the equation of a straight line. Let me remind you that in general, a straight line is defined as y equals mx plus n, where m is the slope or inclination of the line, and n is the point where the line intersects the y-axis. In our messy formula, the left-hand side is the y-axis, and logarithm of the time is the x-axis. The last term is just a constant that we can identify with the intercept n. From this result, we can conclude that Taylor's formula makes the following two predictions. Number one, if instead of the plot r versus t, we make the plot phi divided by two log of r versus log of t, the data would line on a straight line. And number two, since the x-axis, which is log t, in our equation has a factor one in front, this straight line will have a slope equal to one, meaning that it will form a 45 degree angle with the axis. As an added bonus, the crucial observation is that the intercept n only depends on the blast energy E0, which can be inverted to write E0 in terms of n, rho zero, and s. Since the constant s and the air density of rho zero are known, the blast energy can be found from the intercept n. In his paper, we can see the dataset that Taylor created. The central column shows the values of the x-axis, and the rightmost column shows the values of the y-axis. Note that only photographs of the first few milliseconds are included. Even though Taylor had more images available, he knew that the assumption number two used to derive his formula could not be valid at later times, as I mentioned in the previous video. This is what the plot looks like we can confirm that the two predictions of his formula are correct. The data falls along a straight line, and the slope is equal to one. Taylor continued, and from the plot he determined the intercept to be 6.94. Plugging this value in the formula for the blast energy, we get that E0 is equal to 80 terajoules. Converting this energy into TNT equivalent, he obtained 19.1 kilotons of TNT. Taylor reports a value slightly lower, but if you follow his calculation, you will spot a few typos that explain the difference. This is how G.I. Taylor determined the blast energy of the first nuclear explosion. Two months before the Trinity test, on May 7, 1945, the Manhattan Project scientists performed what they called the 100-ton TNT shot, in which 100 tons of TNT were detonated to calibrate and test many of the pressure, temperature, and radiation instruments developed for the real nuclear test in July. Taylor's estimate of the blast energy of the Trinity test is remarkably close to the official value, measuring many different ways to be close to 20 kilotons of TNT equivalent. Just like in the previous video, I have some warnings on myths about Taylor's story. Many lazy versions of the story claim that Taylor used a single photograph to find the energy. This is completely wrong. Just reading the first paragraphs of the paper show that this is not true. Moreover, using a single image implies the extra assumption that the blast radius formula is correct. But the whole point of Taylor was to verify whether or not his formula was right. Taylor did not use one or four images. He used as many as he could that satisfy the original assumptions. Many versions like to add exaggerations to create a better story, but I find no justification to fabricating anecdotes with the whole purpose of making it better. I think the story is already interesting enough. I say this because the most repeated myth is that Taylor used classified images to determine the energy of the Trinity test, which was a military secret. As we saw earlier, the paper was written in 1949, and Taylor explicitly refers to the images declassified two years prior to that. Regarding the yield of the bomb, I claim that this was not a secret in 1949, because just hours after the bombing of Hiroshima, the American president made the first official public announcement of the existence and use of the bomb. A short time ago, an American airplane dropped one bomb on Hiroshima and destroyed its usefulness to the enemy. That bomb has more power than 20,000 tons of TNT. There, in the second sentence of the speech, 
President Truman made public the yield of the bomb, 20 kilotons, again in August of 1945. One could argue that the Trinity and Nagasaki bombs were different from the bomb dropped over Hiroshima. However, the public didn't know these details. They only knew that the nuclear cores were different, one made of uranium and the other made of plutonium. The implosion design was classified until 1951, and the first pictures of how the two bombs used in combat looked were declassified only in 1960. In the last two videos we have seen how Taylor derived the formula for the blast radius, how he used many photographs of the Trinity test to confirm its validity during the early moments of a nuclear explosion, and how the images of the explosion can reveal the blast energy. Taylor's method can be used for other explosions too, but only during the first few milliseconds. For instance, after the terrible ammonium nitrate explosion in Beirut in August of 2020, I used public footage posted on social media to obtain images of the early moments of the explosion to estimate the blast energy. I found this explosion to release the equivalent of around 600 tons of TNT, a value that is in perfect agreement with many other methods published in the literature. I wrote a scientific article intended for undergraduate level students with all the details of Taylor's method and its correct application to the terrible explosion in Beirut. A free version of the published article can be found in the description.